is last week. We started looking at Luke chapter 6, where Jesus gives like his Christian manifesto, his teaching about how he wants Christians to live. It is challenging stuff. We're going to continue that today, our, our hearing from Jesus' manifesto, his sermon on the plan. And so we're in Luke chapter 6. Today we're looking at a very difficult passage about loving our enemies. Uh, Luke chapter 6, 27 to 36. Love for enemies. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. From them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so we are talking today about kingdom ethics. The ethics of the kingdom of God. How God wants us, His followers, to live. And so the disclaimer at the beginning is, this is hard. It's not easy. It doesn't come naturally to us. Part of us as human beings, we like to live our own way. We like to get, not to give. We like to be in the position of power, not the position of humble service. Our natural inclination kind of rails against these ethics of God's kingdom. But Jesus, the Son of God, the one with all the wisdom in the world invites us to live this way. And I don't know about you, but my impression of God, of Jesus, is He's not a mean dictator telling us that we have to do things simply because we have to. He's a God of love who wants what is best for us. So I'm challenging you to see these kingdom ethics as an invitation from God to live your best life. Following His teaching is good for you. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it is worthwhile. And so the disclaimer is, yes, this is hard and difficult stuff. But I promise you, there is some good in this when we get it right. Okay? Now, in the Bible, there are lots of great and important passages on love. And most of them speak about God's incredible love for us. But an important verse on love in the Bible comes from today's reading. Where it says, love your enemies, those who are against you, those who you don't like, those who have hurt you, those who annoy you. Love your enemies. But before we unpack what that's all about and how we love our enemies, the starting point for us is to remember how God loves us. Because none of this loving our enemies is possible unless we fully grasp just how loved we are from God. The only way to live out these kingdom ethics, the, the manifesto of Christianity, is to respond to the love God has already shown us. It's a Bible verse in, in Romans that says, we only love because He first loved us. So this video is from a group called The Bible Project. They have lots of videos on YouTube and they are very interesting. And they teach on all different aspects of Scripture. But today, this video is going to teach us about God's faithful love to us. If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. 
We're going to look at this fourth phrase, loyal love. It translates the Hebrew word chesed, which is hard to translate into any language because it combines the ideas of love, generosity, and enduring commitment all into one. Chesed describes an act of promise-keeping loyalty that is motivated by deep personal care. Like in the story of Ruth, Ruth is a foreigner married to an Israelite man, but tragically her husband dies along with his brother and his father. All Ruth has left is her widowed mother-in-law, Naomi, who has nothing to give her. Naomi tells Ruth she should go back to her people, but instead Ruth promises to stay by Naomi's side and take care of her. And as other people watch Ruth keep this promise over time, they call it an act of chesed. Notice that Ruth's chesed is not conditional or based on Naomi's worth. Rather, it's an expression of Ruth's character. She just is a generous and loving person who keeps her word. That's chesed. Now, Ruth's loyal love is truly inspiring, but the one who shows the most enduring chesed in the Bible is God. Like in the story about Jacob, who is a treacherous liar even to his own family. But despite that, God chooses him and repeats the promise he made to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, that he would have a huge family through whom God would restore his blessing to the nations. And so 20 years later, when Jacob realizes how undeserving he is, he says to God, I'm not worthy of all the chesed you've shown me. And he's right. But God's chesed was never about Jacob's worth in the first place. It's a display of God's generous loyalty to his promise. God's chesed continues into the story of Jacob's descendants, the Israelites. When they're enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt, we're told that God remembered his promise to Abraham and Jacob, so God defeats Egypt and raises up Moses to liberate the people and lead them into the promised land. And in the story, this is called an act of chesed because it was about God keeping his word. Now, on their way to the promised land, the Israelites are scared of the nations around them and they doubt that God can protect them. So the people threaten to kill Moses and appoint a new leader to take them back to Egypt. God is understandably hurt and angry, but Moses steps in and says, forgive the sin of these people because of your great chesed. Notice that Moses asks God to forgive, not because the people deserve it, but because it's consistent with God's own character. And God agrees, and he recommits himself to a people that don't want to be committed to him. In the Bible, God is loyal and loving for no other reason than it's just who God is. Of course, he wants his people to respond with chesed in return, but even when they don't, God's chesed remains. The prophet Hosea compared Israel's chesed to a morning mist that's here one moment and gone the next. But God's chesed is enduring. Like in the celebration of Psalm 136 that opens by saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, and then 26 times repeats, his chesed is forever. And so, after centuries of Israel betraying their commitment to God, and after humanity's long history of violence and death, God still kept his promise in a dramatic and drastic way by becoming human and binding himself to us in the person of Jesus. And the people who followed Jesus of Nazareth said that in him they encountered the God of Israel who is full of loyal love and faithfulness. Jesus is the ultimate loyal and loving human. And in his life, death, and resurrection, God opened up a new future for all of us and for all of creation. And God did this because it's just who God is, generous, loving, and eternally loyal to his promises. And when we experience the purity and power of God's loyal love shown through Jesus, it compels us to reimagine why and how we can show chesed back to God and to the people around us. This is what it means to say that God is overflowing with loyal love. But this idea of loyal love, <clears throat> whenever Jesus teaches us about how he calls us to live, 
It's always done as us responding to the loyal love of God. Perhaps it's even fair to say that we have no chance of living out these kingdom ethics unless we understand, accept, let our hearts be filled and changed by the incredible and enduring love of God. We can only love because He has first loved us. And His love has been poured into our hearts. That's why we can love God. And that's also the only way we can come to the point of loving others, just as we are commanded to. Now we are taught to love others as Jesus has loved us. In fact, we are taught that our love for others will show the world that we are His disciples. We sang that chorus this morning. The Bible tells us that our love will cover over a multitude of sins. It's interesting. Whatever our shortcomings, our not so good enough in our relationships with others, those are kind of covered over if our overall attitude to one another is love. It is powerful, this thing. God loves us. So he calls us to love him in return and to love our neighbor, to love one another, and yes, even love our enemies. Now, maybe you're asking this question this morning. Love our enemies? Surely not. Surely God doesn't expect that. This reading in Luke chapter 6 is really asking a lot, isn't it? Jesus says we are to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, to bless those who curse us, to even pray for those who mistreat us. He says if anyone strikes you on the one cheek, turn the other also. On and on, Jesus asks a lot of those who follow him. These teachings seem so difficult and so, frankly, also misused over the years that it's tempting to like just ignore them. These hard parts, let's rather not pay attention to that. So I want to ask the question and answer it today. Why is it that we have to love our enemies? Now part of the answer is we can't just like cut out the parts of the Bible that we don't like. We can't say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you and I follow you, but not, I'm not following that part and I'm not following that part. I like the blessing and the love part that you have for me. Good. I don't like the love your enemy part. We can't pick and choose. We also have to tackle the harder parts of Scripture. We have to wrestle with what it means to love our enemies and to to do good to those who have hurt us, to bless those who curse us, to pray for them. We have to wrestle with that that our hearts don't easily find ways of doing. You know, in South Africa, we actually have an incredible example of this. I have always been impressed by the the, the now late Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I love him for many reasons, but the main one is he was faithful his entire life. He had a profound ministry of consistency and integrity. What I love most about him is that just as critical as he was about the apartheid government, he was about the ANC government. He wouldn't shut up on issues of justice and righteousness. But you know, that man had a lot to be hateful about. He could have been vengeful and angry. And yet, despite what he faced, he learned to love. Now, he died a couple of years ago of cancer, but I believe in our country, something of his legacy lives on. He was a Christian who taught and who showed how to love our enemies. Now, he was the one who spoke a lot about the need for forgiveness. And that Truth and Reconciliation Commission, whatever you think about it, did a lot of healing good in our country. He was one of the leaders and pioneers of that. Teaching people to love those who have hurt you, to bless those who have cursed you, to pray for those who have got it wrong. And he never deviated from what the Bible taught. He never became bitter. He constantly was able to love those who came against him. He managed to do this throughout his entire life. And so he was asked one day, what's your secret? How do you get this right? How are you able to live that way despite all you've seen and all you've been able to do? 
And his answer is brilliant. It's simple, but it shows a complex level of understanding. He said this. How do you do it? How do you love your enemies? He said, I hold on and often only by the skin of my teeth to believe that God is in charge of this world in spite of all appearances to the contrary. I hold on and often only by the skin of my teeth to believe that God is in charge of this world. When you truly believe that, I promise you, then you can love your enemies. You can pray for those who mistreat you. You can turn the other cheek and you can forgive. And you can do all of this because of this deep-seated inner conviction that, you know what? God is in charge of this world. No matter how bad things look, God is not done. God is working. And it's okay to let go of all of that because God is still not finished working here yet. It's a simple but life-changing belief. It all starts, as does much of our Christian life, our Christian faith, with the belief that God is in control. God is in charge of the world, despite what we see going on around us, despite what is happening on this planet. When you believe that, you can do what He says. Because He's in charge, and He's wise, and He's loving, and we can trust Him. So if He says, love your enemies, we love our enemies. If you, you have to forgive those who hurt you, you find a way to forgive them. You pray for those who abuse you. You can do all of these things because of the inner realization that it's not up to you to fix the world or even fix the attitude of your heart. Conviction is God is control, so do things His way. I love that. And sometimes we can only just hang on to that by the skin of our teeth because of how bad things are or how much we've been hurt, or what people have done to us. But it is still far better to even just cling on to it with the little strength you've got, than to believe anything else. But you know, if Desmond Tutu were here today, he would remind us that there is a much better role model of all of this than himself. And that is Jesus. If we're going to talk about living out the kingdom values, the ones that Jesus taught, we need to look no further than Jesus for an example. When you think about it, Jesus spent his entire life living out what he taught. That's all he did. He was the one who exemplified praying for your enemies, blessing those who curse you, forgiving those who have done wrong to you. No matter what he was facing, Jesus loved even love the people who didn't deserve an answer. You know, when he was on his way to the cross, he was showing love to those who mocked him and spat on him and beat him. He was determined to do good and right by people even when they despised him. And it's perhaps like exemplified no better than when Jesus is on the ground with his arms bound to the cross and the Roman soldiers plunging nails into his flesh. What does Jesus say in that horrific moment of torture? Father, forgive them. They don't actually know what they're doing. He is praying for and forgiving the people who are murdering him. I believe Jesus did this because he was filled with the belief that God was still in charge of the world. In spite of all the evidence to the contrary. And so Jesus could live fearlessly. He could love courageously. He could forgive endlessly. The real question of today is, are we living this way? How are we living in response to the example Jesus has set for us? How do we match up to the life of integrity of someone like Desmond Tutu? Does today's gospel reading, these kingdom ethics, represent the way we live our lives today? Are you and I doing what Jesus says? How's that going for you? (laughs) I struggle with this myself. I find the teachings of Jesus beautiful and inspiring. In my heart, I want to live out my life this way, but so hard when someone annoys me 
or hurts me or does something that I didn't expect from them? How do we love others when they cause those we love pain? When they come against us in a way that really, really affects us negatively? How do you forgive people who have done these unforgivable acts against others or against you or against your loved ones? How do we treat people who are really deserving of judgment and damnation? The truth of the matter is that this world is a place where we deal all the time with people who are not our friends, who don't have our best interests at heart, people who hurt us or wrong us or cheat us or have damaged us or our loved ones. That's a reality. And those are the people we are called to love and forgive. Is it really possible to live like that? You know, all of us can relate to things like, have you ever had a relationship end? Friendship, maybe a family member, maybe even someone you loved, someone who betrayed your confidence, spoke critically about you or your children or your family, didn't do what they said they were going to do or just wronged you. How often do we fail to forgive those kinds of people? We know what the Bible says, but to actually do it is hard. How often have we spoken words of condemnation or judgment on people who are living lives incorrectly? It's easy. When people say things about us, how do we respond? We often want to respond with nastiness or criticism. We always want to hit back with words or thoughts, sometimes even with fists. Have you ever wanted to get even with someone who has wronged you? We've all been there, haven't we? Probably we've even been there this last week. This world is complex. Human beings are difficult to deal with. Relationships are hard. They are fragile. But that's why we need today's gospel reading. That's why it matters. But it's not easy to get right. Now, I don't think Jesus' teaching in Luke 6 is like a how-to lesson. You've got to do this and this and this and this. It's not telling us how to love or reconcile or forgive or be merciful. That's ours to figure out in the living out of our lives. But I think his teaching is intended to stir up a different way of thinking. To unsettle us. To make sure we are moved to not doing what our natural inclination is. But to instead do what God wants us to do. He's trying to give us a wider perspective than what we initially hold on to. And so, the short answer is, how are we doing in response to Jesus? How are we living out these kingdom ethics? The short answer is, probably not very well. I know for me, it's a big struggle. I'm pretty sure it's a struggle for all of us. And so, what I want to end off with is some questions. I want, to consider, I want you to consider these questions on these themes that I think are at play in this reading and how we apply it to our lives. So I want to talk a little bit today about the tension between what God says and how we are living. I want to talk about uh, choice. You know, we've got a choice in this. I want to think a little bit about our behavior. And ultimately, I think we need to also consider how pain affects this stuff. Okay. So firstly, tension. We all live in this gap between the teachings of God's kingdom and our own patterns of thinking and behavior. Do you know what I mean? And we're always kind of negotiating the distance between what Jesus wants and expects from us and what we are actually doing. Do you feel that tension in your life? I know what the Bible says. I'm really struggling to live it out. Or I think I'm doing good at being a Christian until that happened. (laughs) Or that person hurt me. Then we have this pool with inside of us, this tension. I know I should be doing this, but I'm really struggling to get it done. It challenges us. The Word of God is always calling for us to think differently, act differently, enlarge our thinking, love more. And in each of us, there are these contradictions working against each other. So I want to ask you, how are you holding that tension in your life between how you are living, and what it is that God asks for you. And it's maybe like a big tug of war going on all the time. But which side is winning? 
which side is gaining traction in your life? Are you living more and more the kingdom ethics as Jesus teaches? Or do you find that you're losing the battle and actually you're starting to give more and more into living life the world's way or the way of your heart? What's happening with that tension with inside of you? Where are you in that tug of war battle? The second thing to talk about is our actual behavior. Because you know, often here on a Sunday, we sit and I teach about faith is about what we believe. But actually, where the rubber hits the road, it's about behavior. Our faith is not just about what we think, it's about how it makes us live. It's about doing the gospel and the things of God's kingdom. What if we realize that our behavior is an indicator of what we believe and what God really means to us? And so I'm challenging you this week to just look back, to think about your words, your actions, your behaviors in light of this kingdom ethics teaching. What do you see? What do you hear as you think about the way you are living? Where is there alignment to God's kingdom? Where is there misalignment? Your faith is not just what you believe or think. It's actually about how you behave. How you live speaks far more about what you believe than what you actually think. Behavior. The third thing is choice. Because, you know, I sometimes get into the trap of thinking, I am just a a passenger in this thing called life. I don't have a choice in the way things happen. You know, bad things happen and then I just have to go along with them. But you know, every day we are invited with numerous opportunities to make a choice about how we respond to things. We can choose either to live large, be the bigger person, live out our lives as God calls us to, or we can be small and petty and bitter and doing what comes so naturally to us. If we choose to be small, that's when we want to settle the score. We want to act with violence. We want to seek vengeance. We want to get our own back. But if we choose to live large, we'll be in recognition that, you know what? God is in control. And I can let this go. I can pray for that person who wronged me. I can forgive them even though they don't deserve it. I can be the bigger person in the fight or the squabble, or the thing that's going on. What choice are we going to make this coming week? To live large in God's way, or to just settle back to what comes so naturally to us? And then the last thing is pain. This is important. What I know is that the one constant, the universal experience for every human being, is pain. The world is hard. It's a very difficult place. Suffering is real. Every single person here on earth has their own story of pain hidden behind the life he or she shows to you. We can never really know what's going on in the heart or in the life of someone else. Maybe that's why Jesus tells us to not judge them. Maybe that's why he tells us not to condemn them, but to instead be forgiven. And maybe that's why Jesus tells us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hurt us, to pray for those who abuse us, to bless those who curse us. Maybe that's why Jesus' teaching is all about not returning violence for violence. Because maybe we don't actually know the full story of that other person's life. And that not knowing the reasons why they do the things they do, That's why we've got to hold that tension. That's why we've got to pay attention to our behavior. That's why we've got to choose the right way to live. Because you and I might not be able to diminish the pain of the people we deal with in the world, but we neither should we be the ones adding to it. And that's really the bottom line for me in the gospel, the teaching today. Are we adding to the pain of the world around us by living ungodly lives, not taking in the rules of the kingdom? Or are we making the world just a little bit more palatable for us? Making a little bit of difference where we can? Showing a little bit of love and grace where the rest of the world is hard and anti? 
Because the chances are, there are many people in our lives right now who are literally maybe just hanging on by a thread. Maybe it's that family member who's just been difficult recently and we don't know why. Maybe it's that neighbor who has been normally annoying but now just extra annoying. Maybe it's the reason that colleague seems to just grate you up the wrong way. Maybe that's why the stranger that you see coming your way is asking for help. They're in need of love and grace, mercy and forgiveness, a prayer, a blessing, some kind of compassion. That's what God's kingdom is all about. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that this is easy. This is the challenge of your life. It is difficult. But we started off by saying it is not without its reward. God's kingdom is the thing we should be seeking out with our lives. He promises that when we seek Him first, He kind of gives us everything we need. We find a life worth living, not by running after it for ourselves, but by choosing to live life God's way, by letting our behavior match up to the faith that we believe. So may God bless you with this incredibly challenging way of life. May He strengthen you to make those good choices. May you change your behavior to match up to your thinking. And may we be that which doesn't add any pain to the world around us. But perhaps makes it just that little bit better. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? And so Lord Jesus, we thank you that your teaching is hard and complex and difficult. But it is also a source of blessing and wholeness and a good way of living. Lord, we live with that tension all the time. The tension between what we know you teach and how we actually live. We are sorry, Lord, for the times that we lose that tug-of-war battle within us. We pray for your help, Lord. Allow us to start gaining traction into living out your kingdom ethics and values. To go against our natural inclinations and feelings. Help us, Lord, to follow your example and to love when other people don't deserve it. To forgive even when it's hard. To show compassion always. We know, Lord, that we can't do it in our own strength. But we trust and know that you are with us. So won't you help us to live out your kingdom ethics in this world. Amen.